Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our RCIA for Catholics. Uh, let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with us as we always ask you to be with us, and especially to send upon us your Holy Spirit, to open our hearts, to be able to hear and receive your word, and to understand how we can apply that more effectively in our lives, especially as we go through this section of the Catechism, reflecting on the moral teaching of the church. Help us to recognize in whatever ways we might be falling short of the, uh, the people that you are calling us to be that we might repent of our sins, of our selfishness, uh, be converted, and come to you not only for forgiveness, but for the graces that we need in order to live lives of genuine holiness. And so, Father, we offer you these prayers in Jesus' name, who lives and reigns with you forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And uh, again, good, good morning. Um, we are going through the, uh, the moral teaching of the church, and um, we will um, uh, be, in the last session, we began talking about the commandments. Now, in the Gospels, Jesus speaks of the two great commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he says that these two commandments sum up the law. And so as we look at the Ten Commandments, we tend to group them uh, under these two great commandments. Uh, so the first three of the commandments, which we talked about last time, focus on our relationship with God, our responsibilities to God, and what, and what we are called uh, to in our relationship with God. So that's the first great commandment. The second great commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, covers really the, the last seven of the, of the uh, commandments. And so that's where we start today. We're gonna to be talking today about the fourth commandment, which is honor your father and your mother. And so what we see is that once Jesus, or excuse me, uh, once God it has addressed our relationship with him, he now, as he begins to talk about our moral relationships, the place he begins is with the family. That's because the family has such an important role. Uh, it is the only commandment, or the first of the commandments, that actually has a promise attached to it. He says, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God gives you. And so God is telling uh, us through that uh, fourth commandment that if we obey this commandment, that there will be blessings in our lives. And so we want to follow that, first of all, because it's the right thing to do, but also in order to open ourselves to those promises. Now, the fourth commandment is expressly um, uh, directed towards children uh, who are called to honor their mother and their father. But the church sees in that commandment really an ad addressing the whole issue of family and family relationships. And so in the chapter, chapter 28, where it talks about the fourth commandment, it really is talking about our relationships, uh, first of all, with, uh, between parents and children, including adult children, uh, siblings. It also is about our relationship with society. The church sees that the same kinds of relationships that exist within the family also exist within uh, society, that there are people who have legitimate authority and that there are people who have a responsibility, citizens who have a responsibility to obey legitimate authority. So we'll be talking about all of that today as we look at this commandment. So let's talk about the family just in general, the importance of the family. Uh, Christopher West is a uh, teacher of natural family planning, uh, and he teaches uh, about, uh, about the, um, the importance of, of, of faithfulness to God's met, uh, plan, God's original plan. And he says, as the family goes, so goes society. And as the family goes, so goes the individual. You know, in totalitarian uh, states, in communist governments, etc., the, the state is seen as the primary, uh, the, the, uh, the primary uh, uh, unit of, of society, all right? The state, where everything is what is good for the state. What is good for the state? Whatever's good for the state is what is, uh, is all about. Here in America, we have, tend to have a radical individualism, and so we tend to think that what is best for the individual 
That's what the most, those, that's the most important question when we're talking about rights and responsibilities. What is right for the individual? What is uh, the responsibility of the individual? But the church, because of the influence of the scripture and the teaching of scripture, when it looks at all of this, it says that the family is the basic unit of society. And the most important question is not what's good for the state and not even what's good for the individual. What is good for the family? What is good for the family? Now, what's good for the family is also good for society. If the family is healthy, and not just an individual family, but families in general tend to be healthy, you're going to have a healthy society. Also, individuals, we all come out of a family, right? Uh, however uh, healthy or however broken that might be, we all come out of a family. And the healthier the family is, the more likely that the individual is going to be healthy. Now, certainly the family is not the only influence, uh, and so you can have an incredibly healthy family, and you can have uh, a son or daughter that comes from that family who is very broken because they're dealing with biology, that uh, the family may not be able to, uh, to uh, overcome that influence. There is the larger society. There is also our own... <laughs> Um, temptations within us that every one of us has and there is the work of the evil one so you can have a really good healthy holy family and we've all seen this we have an individual that comes from that family who is very broken and who is very lost and makes really really bad decisions but it's much more likely that if you have a really healthy family that the individuals who come from that, the children, are going to be the ones that benefit that from that and are much more likely to be healthy. So if we support the family, we're not taking anything away from society by saying the family is the most important unit because the healthier the family, the healthier society. And we're not taking anything away from individuals when we say that the basic unit is the family because who is going to benefit from that more than the individuals who are a part of that family. So this is the most important thing. And this is why, again, as God moves from our relationship with him to our social relationships, our relationships with one another, where he begins is with the family. As the family goes, so goes society. As the family goes, so goes the individual. The church sees the family as the church in miniature, the church in miniature. Uh, it is um, uh, the family uh, in, the, in the baptismal ceremony. One of the things that's s stated a number of times in the baptismal ceremony to the parents is parents that you are the primary teachers of your children in the ways of faith. You, not the Catholic school, not a CCD program, right? not the parish, but you parents are the primary teachers of your children in the ways of faith. And I've been involved in Catholic education my entire ministry, uh, whether it's been in schools or whether it's in CCD classes and other programs. And one of the things that I can tell you from experience is if it's not happening in the family, then there's a good chance that no matter what we do in that Catholic school or in that CCD program, it's not happening. If it's not happening there, it's not happening. If it is happening in the family, now again, we always remember that families, especially in the society that we live in now, are not the only influence on their children, even though they may be the primary influence, but they are not the only influence. And so, uh, but it's much more likely that if you have a faith-filled family and, they, and kids are growing up and parents are teaching them about God and about Christ and they're teaching them about right and wrong, they're teaching them how to pray, they're taking them to church, they're, see, they're seeing their mom and dad live this out and they're being told this is what you are to do, it's much more likely that that's going to take root in the kids, right? So the family is the church in miniature. It is the, the parents are the primary teachers in the way of in the, in the ways of faith. Also, the church or the family is where we should learn to pray. Yes, we come to church in order to pray, but again, if it's not happening in the family, if, if the kids are not learning how to pray at home, then they're not going to pray well when they come to church. 
I don't know about your experience. I can remember as a little kid um, learning my prayers and my parents' knee were before I would go to bed at night. And I would have to kneel down and say my prayers. And, and uh, going back far enough, early enough in my life, I didn't know those prayers. And so they would lead me in those prayers. Our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, who art in heaven. Hail Mary, hail Mary, full of grace, full of grace. The Lord is with thee, the Lord is with thee. And that is where I learned my prayers. I learned how to pray at the knees of my, ch- of my parents as I knelt with them as, uh, at, at their knees. And they taught me my prayers. This is how I learned it. I don't know how people learn their prayers and, uh, otherwise. You know, I guess what they do is they go to a school or they go to a CC class and they're told they have to memorize these and the prayers then become more about memorization rather than actually praying. Um, I memorize my prayers by praying them with my mother and my father. And I think parents, again, you're the teachers or the primary teachers. That's where kids learn how to pray. And so it's important that our families be places of prayer. Now, that's a struggle for some families. They don't know how to do that. If you came from a uh, family where that didn't happen, it may feel awkward, it may feel uncomfortable to begin to introduce that. Um, But again, something as simple as mealtime prayers. And not worth just rattling off some prayer, but where you really say, okay, let's stop and thank God for what we have. Let's also stop for a moment and think about who we want to pray for. You, know, you can take just a very short 30 seconds to a minute at the beginning of, of dinner and really turn that into an example and a witness to the kids where they are learning how to pray. Also, the family as a, as a church in miniature, it should be operating according to Christian principles. Honesty and integrity should be a way in which the family relates to one another. Um, responsibilities and duties should be a part of all of that. So it is, uh, it's about learning these things at home, learning these things at home. In the family, we learn that we are a part of a community, that it's not all about us. You know, every child uh, is born, you've heard me talk about this before, that I think that every child is born as a little ball of selfishness and self-centeredness, thinking that the entire world revolves around them and, uh, and that everything is about them. And one of the most important things that parents have to teach them is that uh, son or daughter, that's not true. That's not true. You are not the center of the universe, and our lives do not revolve around you. And so you have to be considerate of your brothers and your sisters. You have to be considerate of your mom and dad. We are a society. We are a society. We are a community. And we relate to one another. And that's where we learn how to be a part of a church, of a, of a community of faith, is there in the home. So this is how the church sees the family. It is the church in miniature. So in the catechism, it talks about the duties of various family members, right? Let's talk about those. First of all, the duties of parents. What are the duties of parents? Well, obviously the duties of parents include taking care of those children, providing for them, making sure that they uh, have food to eat and they have clothes to wear and they have, uh, and that they're uh, um, uh, housed, they're under a roof uh, in the midst of, uh, of, of storms and cold and et cetera, all of those things, to make sure that they have the basic material necessities. Uh, but it's also that you make sure that, teacher, that children are given the tools that they need to learn how to live. The purpose of living as a member of the family as a child is not that you will remain there forever, but that someday you will go out on your own and you will be able to function without your parents, that you'll be able to have your own family, that you'll be able to have your own job and your own career, that you'll be able to have your own home and know how to take care of that. And so parents, that is one of the most important things that you do is that you are teaching your child giving them the tools that they need in order to do that. As I said, uh, uh, parents are the first teachers of their children the ways of faith, and we teach them Christian principles so that they can go out and they can live that. What are the responsibilities of children? What are the responsibilities of children? First of all, to obey their parents until they are adults. Now, I've actually had people who are like in their 40s and who will come to confession and say, bless me, Father, for I've sinned. Um, I disobeyed my parents. And it's like, well, you know, you really don't have a duty to obey your parents uh, after you've 
become an adult. You have a responsibility to honor, right, uh, your, your mother and your father. But the commandment says honor. It doesn't say to obey. But we do tend to teach children that a big part of honoring their parents is to obey them. And it is. But that's only for when they are children. But children, they need to know how to obey their parents. This is very, very important. If there's going to be any kind of harmony uh, within the family, then the children need to know how to obey their parents. Again, this is part of learning that everything is not all about me and that I don't get my way all the time, that there are other people who have to be considered. There are, other, uh, there are certain responsibilities and duties that I have, whether I want them or not, that I have to do. And so moms and dads have to be uh, willing to, to set boundaries, to set parameters and say, you can do this and you cannot do that. And it is the duty of a child who is growing up to do those things. Now, children love to question that. They love to challenge that. Well, why do I have to do that? Why do I have to do that? And you can sit down with your child and say, now, here's why you need to do that. You need to do that because it's what we as a family need for you to do if the household is going to function the way it's going to. It is what you need to do, let's say, with your homework. You need to do this so that you can get good grades and you can learn what is in this material so that you can be successful later in life. But you need to f obey us. And sometimes, because we, and you all know this, children don't necessarily, when they say, why do I have to do this, they don't really want to know why I have to do this. They want to prove you wrong. And so no matter what you say, no matter how reasonable it is, they're going to look for a way out. They're going to be looking for a way to say, I really shouldn't have to do this. And at some point, you may have to say that thing that we hated when our parents said it and maybe swore that we would never say, but probably from time to time have to say, which is because I said so, because I said so, because I am the authority in this house. I am your mother. I am your father. And you have a responsibility to obey me, whether you like it or not, and whether you understand it or not. When I tell you to do something and I tell you you can't do something, I do have good reasons behind them. I am not under an obligation to t explain those to you. I may explain them to you if I choose to, but I don't have to. You still have a responsibility to obey. And so, you know, there's a, a, a passage in Scripture that talks about Jesus learned obedience from what he suffered. Right? So he learned how to say yes to God by experiencing things that he didn't want to have to deal with. That's what suffering is. Suffering is dealing with things I don't want to deal with. And he had to surrender to those things. He had to surrender to the sufferings of his life and to say, okay, Father, whatever you say, whatever you ask of me, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, remember it, uh, Jesus' prayer. It's like, Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me, but not my will but yours be done. So Jesus learned obedience. He learned to say yes to God, to his Father, even when saying yes to him was going to be difficult, was going to be painful. And kids, this is how kids have to learn this too. They have to learn that sometimes it's like, okay, go and do your homework. I want to go out and play. Well, no, you have to go and do your homework, and then you can go out and play. And the kid doesn't like that, but they have to learn to say, okay, okay, this is what I have to do. Um, later on, so many kids, again, I think you know, many of us when we were kids, we thought this, well, I'll be glad when I'm out of here and I don't have to obey my parents anymore. And then you get a job and you find out that you have to be obedient to your boss. And there may be a number of bosses that you have. And you think, well, I can't wait until I'm a boss and I don't have to obey anybody. And then you have your own business and you realize you have to be obedient to all of your customers to keep them as customers. You have to do things that you would rather not do in order to keep them happy so they keep coming back to you. So we're all under obedience. We're all under authority. And kids have to learn that. This is one of the most important uh, duties that they have to their parents. But it is also very important because it teaches them that they have to obey. Every one of us is under authority in some way or another. And those of us who refuse to be uh, under authority, again, we've all seen people who rebelled against all authority. And there's a healthy rebellion against unjust authority, but we see people that are just 
absolutely refuse to follow whatever rules or regulations um, that are there for them. This is why we build prisons. It's for people who can't and will not follow rules and who then create chaos and pain and suffering in the lives of those around them. Is that sometimes we have to say, okay, you don't want to follow authority, but here, there is authority. There is authority. So teach, teach our children that they have a duty to obey authority so that they don't end up having to experience an even greater authority sometime later. So the, one of the first things that children have to learn how to do is to obey their parents. And this is why we tend to translate honor your mother and father when we're teaching little children and to obey your father and your mother. But again, as adults, that's not our responsibility to obey our mother and our father. If we are adults and our parents tell us, you know, this is who you should marry, we are not responsible for fulfilling that. If they tell us you can't marry that person, we're not responsible for fulfilling that. If they say this is the career the path that you're going to choose, we are not responsible for fulfilling that. You know, now what are our responsibility to our parents uh, once we become adults? We are certainly to show respect and honor to our parents. That includes even if we have parents who we have problematic relationships with. Some of us have had a parent or both parents who are very difficult, who are not good parents. We, some of us are carrying deep wounds uh, uh, because of the way in which we were raised and the parents that we had. But even then, we're, we have to go and we have to deal with that, but at the same time, we have to, as best that we can, show respect and honor to our parents. Now, recently I gave a sermon in which I was talking about, uh, where Jesus uh, is, is talking about what, what do we do when we're, we have a conflict situation where we have to, a, a brother or a sister has done something wrong and how we should handle that. And I talked in there about that there are certain people in, that may be in our lives who are truly toxic, who are truly toxic, that if I deal with this person, I'm going to get emotionally and spiritually sick. It happens over and over and over. And it might be more about me than it is about them because other people are dealing with that same person who does the same things, but they don't get sucked in to whatever it is that's going on there. And so they don't get sick and they don't get uh, all twisted up by dealing with that person. But maybe I do. And what I may have to do at that point, if I can't figure out what can I change in me in order to make sure that I don't get sucked into that, then I may need to create some distance from that person. Now, what if this is a member of my family? What if it's a member of my family? And I may need to be around them for family events, uh, but I have to go into those family events knowing that this person and I have a toxic relationship, that I can't try to be friends with them, I can't try to engage. If they try to suck me into um, uh, some kind of a game that's, that we've all been playing together for some time, I have to be prepared to say to myself, if not to them, you know, I'm not playing this, I'm not gonna do this, and to disengage from that person. What if that person is my parent? What if that person is my parent? You know, I'm an adult, I'm an adult and I'm dealing with a parent who is, um, uh, and, th and that relationship is, is very, very unhealthy. Maybe I am dealing with a parent who is very manipulative, a parent who is a, an active addict or who is mentally ill and who is uh, saying and doing things that are very destructive and very hurtful to me. Again, we are called to honor our mother and our father. We are called to love that person as best that we can. But we do not do that with foolishness. We do not go into that relationship and into encounter with that person, presuming that this time it's going to be different. Right? If, some, if I get upset because somebody acts the way they have always acted, then there's something wrong with me because I'm expecting them to be somebody different than they have always been. And they're not probably going to be. I go into those situations saying, okay, now, they're gonna do this, they're gonna do that, they're somehow they're gonna pull something here, and I need to be prepared not to get sucked into it. I have to respond to it, I don't have to react to it. Those two words are really significant. Learning how to respond rather than to react. If I react, then I get sucked into the sickness. I get sucked into the toxicity. 
if I respond, all right, that I can honor that person, that parent, that may be very sick and very disturbed parent, I can honor them and I can love them, but I don't get sucked into the toxicity. There may be times, and some of us know situations like this, uh, where we may have to truly create a distance from someone, from a parent, or it could be someone else, but here specifically, we're talking about a parent, you know, where I can't be around that person. If that person is too abusive, if that person is violent, you know, then I don't pretend that that's not true. I acknowledge that that is true, and I have to create distance. But perhaps I can keep in touch with that person through a phone call or through writing a note, uh, or maybe not. Maybe not, maybe even uh, writing a note just kind of triggers whatever goes on. And maybe I just need to stay apart from that person and uh, to pray for that person, for that parent. And then if they ever need some kind of real assistance that I can provide for them, uh, that I can uh, provide for them without getting sucked in to the toxicity, then I need to be willing to do that. Even for a bad parent, even for a bad parent, we try to honor our mother and our father. This is part of the duty uh, as, uh, that we have as adults. Um, if we've got a parent that that's not, and I don't want to just focus on the negative, but, uh, but if we've got a, a decent relationship with family, and this has changed a lot too, you know, because we're such a mobile society. It used to be that most people lived uh, their entire lives within uh, 20 minutes of their parents. They lived within the same uh, city or the same town or the same neighborhoods. And uh, many, and some people still do. But often today, because of the types of careers and the reality of economics and, uh, and, and situations, you know, I uh, may have, uh, have grown up here in Covington, and, uh, but now you're living in California, or you're living in New York, you may be even living in Europe or somewhere else. And so we are not as physically connected sometimes. And it used to be that there are uh, large families. And so there were a number of people who were working, and mom and dad are getting sick and getting elderly. There's a number of people who are taking care of them, and, and if one or two of the kids have to move away because of whatever circumstances, then there's other kids who are going to be close to home who are going to be able to take care of mom and dad. In a world in which uh, more and more families are one or two or three kids, um, if one kid has to move away because of career, because of family situ their family situation, then mom and dad may very well be on their own. They may not have another kid around when they begin moving into uh, uh, being older and needier. And so it becomes much more difficult to figure out how can I be supportive of mom and dad uh, from you know thousands of miles away. How do I make sure that they're receiving the support and the assistance that they need and that certainly I would be helping physically to provide if I lived close by, but I don't and I can't. So we have to try to figure that. But we do as best as we can, especially as our parents get older, we need to be willing to take care of them. As they took care of us as, our, as kids, we must take, help to take care of them as, a, uh, uh, as they become elderly. Uh, there's a, a place in scripture in one of the Psalms and it talks about that uh, the children are like arrows in a quiver, all right? So if you're in a battle, this in war is kind of seen as this battle, this war, all right? And you've got uh, a number of sons and daughters and you've got a lot of arrows and you can, you can deal with life uh, because you're armed, you're ready, all right? But unfortunately today, many uh, parents don't have that and that becomes a great burden. That becomes a great burden. Let's say that there are three kids in my family and that two of them have moved uh, far away. That means one kid is still living close by and a lot of the responsibility to take care of those parents is falling onto that child, all right? So we have to find a way for that not to become uh, overly burdensome so that that person can't have a life of their own. And I've seen that happen where somebody is so overwhelmed by the duties of taking care of a mom or a dad or a mom and dad that they are no longer able to really live their own lives. It's like almost all their time and energy is going into that. Uh, the good thing is that we are living in an age 
which other uh, societies did not, uh, earlier people did not, where we do have um, assisted living situations that people can enter into and that we can help support them in those assisted living situations uh, where uh, there's somebody who's going to make sure that they've got food, they're going to make sure that their, uh, their apartment is going to be cleaned and they're going to be taken care of. There are, uh, there are nursing homes, there are uh, various types of situations that uh, exist, so that, uh, but we are responsible to help our parents when they reach an, a time of need in their own lives. So we show them respect and love, and where needed, we offer them support and we take care of them. We may very well may reach a point where we need to take a parent or both parents into our own home. Uh, that can be very disruptive, that can be uh, require a great sacrifice. I've talked before that one of the great witnesses I had in my own life, uh, this was not about kids taking care of parents, but it was about my grandmother. My grandfather had been sick most of his life. He had had a lot of, a lot of health issues. And when he got into his early 70s, he had a series of serious strokes that really reduced him to a child and eventually reduced him to where he was bedridden. And my grandmother had a hospital bed brought into the house and put into their bedroom. And she took care of him, she took care of him. Now, this was a very difficult thing where she would have to change him, she would have to clean him uh, after uh, he would lose control of his bowels, she would have to uh, feed him as she would a child. And this went on for a couple of years. And I just can't imagine I, you know, that her whole life, her whole life was taking care of him. But what that gave me was an understanding of what love means. You know, especially on your wedding day, when a couple look at each other and, and they say, I take you for, uh, in, uh, in sickness and in health for better or for worse. And most couples, I think, when they say those words, they really don't think it's going to be that bad. Um, they think that it's still going to be a lot of romance and things are going to be wonderful and nice. And sometimes it's very, very hard to love. Sometimes that love demands a great deal from us. And my grandmother showed me uh, through her example, through her witness, what it meant to love her husband. Well, you know, we, as we learn how to love our parents, right, that's also a factor there. And it may be too. We can turn this around. You know, there are uh, people who have a child, let's say a child who, had, who is uh, severely um, handicapped and requires a great deal of care each and every day, all day. And that can be very overwhelming, overwhelming, right? And so when we, if we face that, then it's just like, oh my gosh, this is a calamity, my life is over. But what the reality is, is that that may be God's way of teaching us how to love. Well, we have to learn. It's easy to love a kid that's, uh, uh, that's healthy and that is a really great kid and does everything right and gets good grades and is very obedient and every, very responsible. It's uh, very respectful. It's very easy to love a kid like that. It may not be easy to love some kids. Some of you have kids that are not that easy to love. They demand, uh, whether through handicaps or just through uh, their behavior or even through some kind of um, emotional and mental uh, issues that they have, they may be hard to love. And I don't mean that uh, in, to say that uh, they're not lovable. What I mean is that loving them demands more than we sometimes think we know we can give. And so we, we have to grow. We grow in learning to love, and that's within the family. That's within the family where we learn how to love, whether it's loving our kids, loving our parents, loving our spouses, loving our siblings, whoever it is. You know, we are in this world to love. St. Paul, in that great uh, hymn to love uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, and he closes that by saying, in the end, there are three things that last, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. You know, uh, ultimately, ultimately, our lives are about love. Again, what did, when Jesus was asked, which are the two greatest commandments? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love, love is ultimately the only thing we have that lasts, right? We don't take any of our stuff with us we don't take any of our titles with us. We don't take any of our sports trophies with us. 
We don't take our businesses or our houses or our cars with us. There's that saying, I love the saying, that you never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul because it doesn't make any sense. None of that goes, none of that goes. We go without that. But St. Paul says that there are three things that last. And even he says that faith and hope will not ultimately last. In heaven, there will not be faith. We won't need faith because we will see God face to face. Hope is faith kind of projected into the future. And there won't be, I hope someday this is gonna happen because we will possess everything. So there is no faith and there is no hope in heaven. The only thing that will last will be love. And it is within the family primarily that you and I will learn how to love. Now we have to take that outside of the family. We have to take that into the other experiences of our lives. And there too we will learn how to love. But it's in the family where we learn that to begin with. So parents have responsibilities to their children. Children have responsibilities to their parents as, as children, but also as adults. So the church looks at the family as a mini society. Not only is it the church in miniature, but it is the society in miniature. And so the relationships within society are often in many ways, but through the church's understanding, based on how families operate. Remember the family is the basic unit of society. And so when we look at society, the society is the, as the family should be a church in miniature, right? So the church, or excuse me, the family is society in miniature, all right? So there is authority. As there is authority within the family, there is authority within society. Uh, and and um, if you think about Pontius Pilate, as he is, uh, uh, Jesus is on trial before him, and he says, do you not know that I have authority over you? And Jesus responds and says something very important for our understanding here. He says, you would have no authority if my father had not given it to you. You have no authority if my father had not given it to you. Uh, we also remember when Jesus was challenged about whether uh, the Jewish people should pay the tax to Rome. And he uh, says, uh, give me the coin. And he, they hand him the coin. He says, whose head is on this coin? They said, Caesar's. He says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. So what, that's, what Jesus is teaching us in these two examples is that we do have responsibility to legitimate authority. And even Caesar, even Caesar had some level of legitimate authority. And Jesus is acknowledging that. Even though he, that Rome had conquered them and was ruling them, uh, they still owed something to Caesar. Certainly, as we uh, live in a, uh, a democratic uh, society, uh, uh, in a republic, then uh, we have elected officials who are our representatives, or at least they're supposed to be our representatives, that we send them to D.C. or we send them to Frankfurt or lo more locally, we send them to the courthouse or wherever in order to act as our representatives, right? So, but they have certain authority. Certainly, one of the challenges we're going through right now through this COVID pandemic, a lot of people are very upset because of the regulations that are being put on about wearing masks and, and uh, social distancing that are being uh, given to us from authority, all right? Well, there is legitimate authority, all right? That they, that, uh, now, there is also illegitimate authority, and we have to talk about that too. As a family needs authority, parents, making decisions and making sure that uh, children are obeying that in order for the family to function so for society to function there has to be authority there has to be authority they have to be people who are in charge a society cannot operate without that um, laws that are passed are intended to help us to live together how to cooperate with one another Right? Uh, if we all use good sense, then maybe we wouldn't need speed limits on the highway. We would just drive a reasonable uh, speed, uh, taking everybody else's needs and concerns into consideration. But many, if not most of us, would not do that. And so we need society to say, okay, you can drive this fast. And if you drive faster than that, you are going to create 
uh, problems for everybody around you, so there will be fines that will be attached to that. Uh, this is true for all of the laws that are hopefully intended, intended to help society and, and help us together, uh, to work together, to live together, to, to deal with one another in ways where we don't um, uh, bump up against each other and cause harm. So uh, there, uh, there is just authority. Now, what are the duties of civil authorities? Uh, well, first of all, and we certainly recognize that here in the United States, it's not always carried out, but that they carry out their duties as a service. God has give, created authority, even within governments, even within governments that we might consider to be bad governments, that we might be considered to be um, uh, illegitimate governments. We may look at a totalitarian government. We may look at a communist government, et cetera, et cetera. Right? But every government, every society, there are these legitimate authorities, right? but that they exist to serve the people. They may not recognize that, and that's their failure. That's their failure, is when they begin to believe that the people are there to serve them, rather than they are there to serve the people. Even someone like a king, I think here in the United States, we have a tendency to think of kings and queens as somebody who is over and, every, and they have all this authority and everybody's job is to serve the king. Well, that's not how people who have had kings throughout the centuries, if you read about monarchies, the idea was that the king was a representative from God who was there to serve the kingdom, to serve the people to help the people, uh, to protect the people, to, uh, to provide for the people. So they are there to serve. They are there to serve. And there are elected officials, appointed officials, who forget that, who forget that. Who, and, and, you know, we're all sinful human beings. We all have a tendency to, uh, to selfishness and self-centeredness. But when that begins to happen, we need to remind them, hey, you know what, you're there to serve us. We're not here to serve you. Right? You're there to serve us and to help us as best as you possibly can. And if they don't learn that, if we are in a society like our own, where we can elect and, uh, and unelect people, then maybe we need to remove them. Uh, so they carry out their duties as a service. Uh, the duties of civil authorities is also to respect the rights of citizens. Citizens have rights. Those are more clearly deline delineated in the United States than in many other countries. All right? We talk about the right of, uh, rights of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. All right? uh, we have a whole bill of rights uh, with 10 amendments to the Constitution, talking about a, a right to um, free assembly, a right to uh, free speech and press, etc. You know, there, there are rights. Now, rights do not come from the government. The government may, as it has in the United States, delineate some of those rights, but rights come from God, and they come from the dignity of human nature. That's where the rights come from. They are not, privileges are what the government allows us, but rights belong to us because of who we are as human beings and because of God. And so we have certain rights to freedoms. Again, freedom of speech, the freedom to express our opinion, to uh, even if that opinion is not uh, popular, and especially if that freedom, that, that, that opinion is not popular. You know, we, we live in a society where um, freedom of speech is being very limited today. Uh, we don't hear so much of this right now, but just a few years ago, we were hearing a lot about on college campuses where uh, uh, there were supposed to be uh, spaces on campus where nobody was allowed to say anything that would be offensive to anybody else. All right? Now, I don't think that we should go around intentionally being offensive to other people, but if I can't express my opinion because it offends you, we don't have freedom of speech. We don't have freedom of speech. And it's especially unpopular f speech, uh, speech that somebody finds offensive that needs to be protected. You look again in Nazi Germany, all right, if you criticized uh, Hitler, uh, then that was a crime. You were not allowed to do that. Where there was a need for freedom to criticize Hitler. We need to be able to have that freedom. And so our civil authorities, whether they're elected or appointed or however else they become authorities, they have a responsibility. They have a duty 
to respect our freedoms and to not violate those freedoms, and they have a responsibility to protect those freedoms. Um, also, uh, they have a um, duty to encourage that citizens fulfill their responsibilities. There are things that we as citizens need to be uh, willing to do. One of the things that is very sad in our country uh, is how few people actually vote. Elections are decided by about 40 to 50 percent of the populace because that many people do not vote. Right? There, we have a responsibility to say this is our government, so we need to, to vote. We need to look and say, what, you know, are, what are these people saying? What are they going to be doing? And then choosing our, uh, uh, our citizen, or excuse me, our, our civil authorities. There are also other responsibilities and duties. Certainly, we have to pay taxes. We don't like paying taxes, all right? When some taxes perhaps are unjust and are unfair, and we uh, have to challenge that perhaps, but we have to pay taxes. You know, I really like streets. I really like hospitals. I really like schools. I really like a lot of things that require taxes to be collected, including from me, in order to have these available. And so I have a responsibility. So they do, uh, civil authorities do have uh, um, a duty to uh, make sure that citizens are fulfilling their responsibilities. Uh, civil authorities are also responsible for distributive justice. Now what does that mean? It really means taking care of the poor and the needy. It, it would be great, and the churches do, do a lot to take care of the poor and the needy. You know, we have Parish Kitchen, which is uh, founded really here at Mother of God Church and is uh, overseen by Catholic Charities. It's, it is an act of faith. Uh, but we also need uh, other organizations to help to take care of the poor and the needy. The churches can't do this by themselves. They do not have the resources to do everything that needs to be done. Uh, and so the care for the poor and the needy. Uh, providing education. Yes, we have Catholic schools, but the, the Catholic churches and the, and the other churches cannot provide education for all of the children of the United States. And so there's a need for civil authorities to do that. They take taxes in order to do that, and they have to oversee and guide those. Again, they can do a good job of that, and they can do a poor job of that, of overseeing it, but it is their responsibility. It is their duties. Um, clearly then, too, uh, the, one, the responsibilities of, of the civil authorities is to protect society. And this is uh, police officers, and, and we are in a time when a lot of people are talking about defunding the police and eliminating the police, I don't even know what that would look like. I really do not, cannot even imagine a society in which we try to eliminate the police. Uh, I believe we maybe need to retrain a lot of our police officers to make sure that they, they know more nonviolent ways of dealing with, with criminals, but, uh, and, that, and that there are reforms that need to take place. I think that's obvious as we look around the country. But we need police officers. We need fire people. We need um, you know, firemen and firewomen who are gonna help to fight the fires. We need a military. I wish we didn't. I wish we didn't. You know, I'd love to be the kind of a pacifist who would say, you know, we'll just get rid of our armies and everything's gonna be okay. Because I know if we get rid of our army, everything's not gonna be okay. We get rid of our military, everything's not gonna be okay. You know, we're not going to be able, you know, we won't, we will be defenseless. And that that is not what we are called, uh, uh, called to. So, um, there are responsibilities of the authorities. And there's also duties of citizens uh, to obey legitimate authority and laws. Again, now, um, uh, legitimate authority and laws. Again, they set a, a speed limit and I will plead absolutely guilty of the fact that I'm not great at following the speed limit. I was joking recently, I was following somebody who was going the speed limit and it was driving me crazy. And I said, I really hate following people who drive the speed limit because I always want to go a little bit over the speed limit. But, uh, but society has a right to set those and I really have a duty to obey legitimate authority and laws, including speed limits, but also in other things, in other situations. We also have a duty as citizens to oppose 
illegitimate authority and laws. If someone was to take over the United States, right, as uh, um, in some kind of a coup or in some kind of a military over uh, uh, taking it over, then we would have cer a certain level of responsibility, depending on our station in life and our capacity, to resist, to resist that authority and to seek its overthrow. Uh, we are not to obey unjust laws. We are not to obey unjust laws. If the society tells us that we are to do something that is clearly immoral, then we cannot do that. We are not to follow that. That's a duty that I have, is to resist unjust laws. Martin Luther King talked about this, all right, uh, in his letter uh, from the Birmingham jail. And he talked about civil disobedience and how it was morally necessary to resist uh, unjust laws. Right? We have a law that says that uh, we, we are going to uh, do something that's going to oppress someone, then I have a duty not to obey that. I have a duty not to obey that. Um, if we think back to after, uh, after the Second World War and the trials that took place in Germany of those who had been the officials there uh, during the time, and what was it, in, in the, whether it was in the prison camps or with the armies, when they had done um, uh, horrific uh, things. And what was their argument over and over and over? I was just following orders. I was just following orders. Right? And it was determined that was not a legitimate defense. Saying that you're just following orders, you do, you do not, uh, you cannot just set aside your own conscience because you are taking authority from a higher, uh, orders from a higher authority. We have a duty, we have a duty to oppose illegitimate authority and laws, all right? Um, but we are, we have a duty also to work with legitimate authority to build up a just society, to make this world a better place, to make this nation a better nation, to make this state a better state, to make this city or this community a better place. So we see that the family and society and the church are operating under very similar circumstances because they are very similar. The church becomes a model, really, of what a just society is supposed to be. The family becomes a model, right, for what a good church is supposed to be. And they work together. They work together. And when they're working together, right, then we can produce a good society and a good uh, community, and we can produce good, healthy families. And if we have good, healthy families, we're much more likely to have good, healthy individuals, and we're much more likely to have a good, healthy society itself. And so, I just want to wrap up and say that the family is, uh, is so important and it is what is best for the family is what is best for the individual and what is best for society. And so society, individuals, and the church must work together to assure the strength and the health of the family. Next week we'll be doing um, the uh, fifth commandment, which is, of course, uh, thou shalt not kill which again opens up many, many different issues, certainly. Uh, we uh, live in that time, Pope John Paul II described the present age as this uh, kind of battle between the, uh, the gospel of life and the culture of death. And, we, and that's still going on around us. And so we see a lot of issues. We see a lot of issues like abortion, capital punishment, uh, war, um, and, and uh, euthanasia, et cetera that we're gonna to have to touch on next week. So I hope that you'll be with us next week and the Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you.